name is Jen Fritzstein. I am the manager of the Trauma and Burn Program here at Children's National. Um, and what that really means is that we are monitoring, writing, working on guidelines, looking at evidence, um, making sure that our practice with our trauma and burn patients from anywhere from EMS through rehab or clinic, um, that, that we are really maintaining our ability to keep up with the literature, that we are watching our benchmarks, and we are constantly looking on how to um, elevate our program um, to be competitive nationally and to be kind of on that national stage. Um, so just a couple minutes, I want to just talk about what does it mean to be a trauma center and a burn center. Um, a lot of the rules are not set by us. We have governing bodies that tell us exactly what it is we have to do to be a trauma center. And for trauma, it is the American College of Surgeons, which is a national verification. They come in every three years. And this little gray book you see here on the screen, this is what I refer to as the trauma Bible. It tells me every single thing that we have to meet or have to have in place in order to be a trauma center. Now, things in there that include stuff like nursing continuing education. I have to show good continuing education. I have to show, uh, uh, because of Maryland, I have to show everybody who takes care of trauma patients, independent of where you, depending on where you work, either have four or eight hours of trauma education a year. Um, not only does the American College come in every three years, but um, the Maryland State, or MIMS, comes in every three years. And their guidelines are pretty much the same. Other things that are in that gray book is I have to have 24-7 neurosurgery coverage. Uh, within that neurosurgery coverage, I have criteria in which a neurosurgeon has to be at the bedside in 30 minutes. Same thing with orthopedic surgery. Uh, within that book, it talks about uh, Dr. Bird, who's our medical director and his qualifications. It talks about different equipment that we have to have at the bedside. It looks at OR ready time um, for emergency cases. It looks like how quickly we can get to CT, get out of CT. It looks like how we address problems within our system and that we fix our systems and our processes so things won't happen again. So it really, really is very heavy quality focused. And it's one of the reasons that um, you see us constantly changing and updating guidelines and looking at the way we practice. Uh, one specific improvement we're working on right now is we are doing a project called um, OR First. And the OR First project is uh, centered around severe head injured children that come into our code room. And it is looking how to decrease time, like door to CT time, and because it's what we see on that CT time that tells us how quickly we need to get to the OR. And so those are some of the benchmarks that we look at and the literature that we're using. Um, the next lecture I'm going to do after this one is all on massive blood transfusion. And massive blood transfusion came to Children's National because trauma had to have it. And so several years ago when that book was green, it's been green and it was orange and now it's gray. Every few years it gets updated. When that book was green, it said, Trauma centers need to be thinking about having a massive blood transfusion program. So we went to blood bank. We, you know, did all the legwork, looked at the literature, and worked with the blood bank to develop massive blood transfusion, which is interesting because trauma doesn't use it the most, even though we were kind of the driving force. Um, and then after massive blood transfusion, it's because of this gray book, things like blood refrigerators are now in the ICUs and the emergency department. It is um, really like it, it, it has sparked a lot of positive changes uh, for the hospital that don't just benefit trauma, but benefit everyone. And those are just a couple of those examples. Um, and so having these verifications gives us the opportunity to go to leadership and say, but we have to. Um, and it puts it in writing and I can get a whole lot of stuff my way because I can point to these books. And the same thing happens for a burn center. Our burn center verifications are every five years right now. Um, and we are verified just by the state of Maryland currently. Now, the American Burn Association does have a verification. Um, up until recently, we have chosen as a hospital not to be ABA verified. However, we do work with the ABA. All of our data is submitted to the ABA. Um, I just don't pay the money for them to come in and verify us. 
However, we are considering changing that. So you might see over the next few years um, the American Burn Association coming in to do our verification. Um, our Maryland verification is actually due in a year, so we may do them both at the same time. With these verifications, what happens, whether it's burn or trauma, is that in these three or five year periods of time, we have experts in, in the field come in. Uh, it's always uh, to, uh, at least one surgeon. For trauma, it's two surgeons. For burn, it's one surgeon and a nurse. Um, and then a representative from the state of Maryland comes in and they look at everything in our trauma and our burn program from how many patients we had to how do our nurses chart and how quickly can we get a blood pressure charted? How quickly do we get to the OR? How do we handle problems that we see? How are we fixing stuff? Um, and they're funny, when we go to fix stuff, it's not just education. And matter of fact, they'll, they'll frown on that. They don't want us doing death by education. They really want us to look at our processes, how things are done, drill down on why things have caused problems, find the reason and fix it at the root. Um, instead of just saying, hey, let me teach you about this and try a little harder. So it does really keep us very honest. Now, so what? We're a trauma center and a burn center. Okay, we can tell that. That is great. But what does it actually mean? Well, as far as pediatric trauma centers and burn centers, uh, there's Children's National and there's John Hopkins in the region. Um, for the state of Maryland, we work together pretty well. We kind of divide the state of Maryland which means a good part of Southern Maryland, um, Montgomery County, PG County, a lot of St. Charles County, um, Washington County uh, usually come here. The rest are, are going up to Hopkins and we kind of subdivide. And we need both of these centers. Without both of these centers, we would be overwhelmed. Both, uh, Hopkins would be overwhelmed if we didn't exist. We would be overwhelmed if Hopkins didn't exist. And so because of that, it allows our pediatric patients in the state of Maryland, as well as D.C., we get all of D.C., um, to come to, to be close to a trauma center. And what that really means being close to a trauma center is that they have access to care fast. If kids, patients who live within a 25-mile radius of a trauma center are injured within a 25-mile radius of a trauma center, their odds of positive outcome improves significantly. And the farther away you get, the poorer your outcomes be. And so because we are so close here in DC, Maryland, and even some West Virginia, Northern Virginia kids, it really does impact the outcomes of our trauma patients. Now, other things, you know, with the so what to being a level one trauma center, it, it forces us to do a lot of things. Again, that evidence-based care, both in the emergency department as well as emergency surgery, as well as our continued care. One of the things that Graybook is, one of the new standards it has now is that we need to have a policy and we need to implement mental health screening within our trauma program because we are now truly recognizing the mental health impact of trauma. Um, other things we're doing based on evidence is implementing a, a guideline to early rehab. And so we're working with the PM&R department on how do we get rehab to the bedside with our, our injured patients faster. Uh, level one trauma centers, we are mandated to have the subspecialist. We could not be a trauma center without cardiology or even CV surgery when you look at some of the vascular stuff. So a lot of those things that you don't always put with trauma are kind of mandated through our verification. Again, like I said, it gives us a lot of access to imaging, blood bank, and lab. Massive blood transfusion came out of the trauma, trauma regs, uh, the implementation of TXA, uh, some of our imaging protocols. We, have a, we talked about a robust quality program. And what I haven't talked about yet is that two really wonderful things that are a result of being a trauma and burn center is our very established approach to how we look at childhood injury. And the fact that we have a whole position that is uh, injury prevention. We have safe kids that looks at, we'd like to look at how to put ourselves out of business. I don't think it'll ever happen, but we continually try. And so it's not just getting out in the community and, um, you know, handing out bicycle helmets or handing out tub testers, 
But we really look at injury prevention in a more global fashion. Uh, Cindy's done a lot of work over the past couple years uh, with social media, getting messages out on burn prevention and fall prevention. Um, we have worked with government affairs. We've been involved in some legislation. There's a law that was passed in Montgomery County called Ezekiel's Law, um, which uh, looked at kids who fell out of windows and looked at uh, laws for, in Montgomery County for window guards in apartment buildings. And a lot of that kind of starts, starts here with our data and our ability to push that out. And then finally, we have a very robust research program. Uh, Dr. Bird really runs our research program, and we have done a lot. It, our goal with our research program is to decrease um, errors in chaotic events. And so you'll see we put video downstairs. We've done a lot of work on communication on role development and really looking at how do you use technology in order to take some decision decision making out of chaos um, and really kind of streamlining the care that we give. Um, all that works together gives us a, these verification and when the college comes in and when MIMS comes in, um, we're able to tout all of these things um, based on the care that you guys are giving, um, following these guidelines, following um, the evidence that we've put into place. Like I said, in trauma, we are verified every three years. We are due again in 25, 24, 21, 22, 23, 24. Sorry, I had to do the math. We're due again in 24, and with burn, we will do our next burn verification in September of next year in 23. So as far as, what was I even going to say here? Um, where trauma starts, you know, what we look at as a verifying center, as a trauma center, like I said, it goes from the minute in patients are injured all the way through rehab or clinic follow-up. You know, so it really does start with the EMS. We have, as a trauma center, we uh, have relationships with our EMS partners uh, to be able to give feedback, to be able to work together. There are members of uh, some of our team that are on protocol committees for EMS, both in DC and Maryland. Um, and so we work with that. We work with EMSC. EMSC is a federally funded initiative within states, and it helps us kind of support and improve the medical care and transport of children. Um, what EMSC has been really focused on over the past few years is making sure that our transferring hospitals and that our ambulances um, have pediatric equipment. And that doesn't sound like it would be difficult, but it has been a monumental event. When you think of all the small hospitals out there that are maybe the first stop for an injured child and the lack of pediatric equipment that they may have. Um, ECIC here, if you've never been up to ECIC, this is kind of a, a picture of one of the ECIC stations. They provide communication uh, with the ambulance, the outside hospitals, and patch them in and get them to our medical control in order for kids to be, not only our injured kids, but medical kids to be transferred into the hospital. They work with um, the main department for some of those direct admits. They work through the medical control officer, both in the ICU and the ER, in order to get kids to the right place when they need to transfer. They also work with them to help determine how we're going to bring children in, whether it's going to be by flight or by air, or by flight or by ground, sorry. Um, and transport then does uh, have a huge role in uh, really helping getting some of those patients to us that are initially treated and stabilized at the outside hospital. Once kids get here, um, almost all traumas are going to go through our trauma bay. We do not like to direct admit, and there's a lot of back-end reasons why that um, but the long and the short of it, even if they've been stabilized in another hospital, they will still, still come through our trauma bay, in which we can do a quick primary secondary survey. The goal here is, if they've already been seen someplace else, is to make sure that there were no missed injuries. It gives us opportunity to quickly add imaging. Um, and when you're in this code room, you have priority imaging over pretty much everybody in the hospital. Um, they got to have a pretty good excuse to bump us from from the CT scanner. Um, and of course, this room takes a lot of our patients, probably 60% of our patients are gonna be coming from the field, EMS bring them directly into our trauma bay. Um, there's criteria that uh, an injured child has to meet in order to uh, have care in this trauma bay. And 
I didn't put a picture of a full trauma bay. I probably should have. This looks like a nice big room, and it very quickly gets filled once a patient uh, comes in. I think yesterday, last night when I was in there, I counted about 25 people um, at one time. And so it definitely can be chaotic as we are looking to stabilize and identify injury. And then, of course, once our kids are stabilized, about 40% are going to go home, which is pretty incredible. And a lot of that is because kids come in based on some mechanism. It's just they have a high enough energy. Um, you know, they were in a car crash that was going pretty fast, and they weren't adequately restrained, and we just want to make sure they're okay. Um, so those types of kids will go home. About 60% of our kids are going to be admitted. Um, majority are going to go to acute care. Um, but a, a good percentage will go to the ICUs um, for their inpatient stay. And again, same trauma guidelines are intact. Um, if you have your phone and if you're getting service and you want a new app, um, we have developed an app, I may have it later on, in which we, we now have all of our trauma guidelines and resources and some education that is now at your fingertips. And we did this because have you ever tried to keep up a paper manual? It's almost impossible. So the paper manuals would get out of date really fast. We wanted to make sure that you guys at the bedside knew exactly what was at, the expectations of trauma care was. And so now we have this app that I probably update a couple times a month. Um, a very small subset of our kids will have um, emergent or urgent OR needs. Um, this is what we look at kids going from the either the ICU, the floor, or the ED and needing to get to the hour within 30 minutes to two hours because of something that's acutely wrong. Um, a good portion of our burn patients are going to go to the OR, like scheduled OR time, and they're going to go multiple times. Um, an average burn patient uh, that's admitted. An average admitted burn patient will go to the OR two to three times with, uh, for uh, wound, wound debridement and plus or minus skin graphing. And then, of course, we don't have in-house in rehab, but we do have good, um, we have good relationships with the rehab centers here in D.C. As well, and Maryland. And, of course, HSC is run by children's. It's just not within our main campus walls. So how many kids come in a year? This was FY22. Um, we saw, I have to really do the math quick, but I believe the end number was 533 kids came through our code base last year. Um, you can see in the blue, those are kids that met attending um, activation criteria. So that meant they were hemodynamically unstable um, and had high potential to go to the OR. The green, and the, uh, the green and the red are our basic trauma stats, and our purple and that aqua color are our transfer patients who have transferred in from other hospitals, and we're just making sure we haven't missed injuries. So we had a really busy year last year. 433 is actually a little bit on the high side. Um, Pre-COVID, we were seeing probably 480 a year. And then COVID hit, and trauma and burn, unlike the rest of pediatrics, went up when kids were home. And ever since, we have stayed up, and we seem to be going up, up, up. As a matter of fact, one of our biggest increases that we have been seeing over the past few years are gunshot, in, gunshot wounds. The majority of these kids um, are between the ages of 13 and 17. Now, some of you may know, we only accept trauma patients from the scene up to your 15th birthday. So why am I getting all these 17-year-old gunshot wounds? They literally are coming knocking at the door. We've had them knocking at the ambulance door. They get dumped off in front and somebody pulls them in. Um, but we have taken penetrating injury or gunshot wound injury. If you look at 20, uh, FY17 um, and FY18, our average was about 3% gunshot wounds. And you can see as the pandemic hit what happened. And so far right now in FY23, we are sitting at 11%, which is just quite unprecedented. And I'd like to say that we are an anomaly. However, this is something that's being seen all over the country in pediatric centers. Um, our burn volume has also went up significantly. You can see we were admitting 
2017, 2018, between 50 and 60 kids a year. We're now admitting about 93, 90, 93. Um, as far as ER visits in the blue, that stayed pretty constant. We had kind of a bump up in 21. I put 22 numbers in here. But where we're really seeing our increases in clinic visits, reason being is that burn care is very manageable outpatient. And so we have a lot of patients that are seen in an ER, seen at a doctor's office, seen in an outside ER, and then do a lot of follow-up with us in clinic. Um, right now, we are on track for about 2,000 clinic visits this year. Um, as far as the ER, we're staying pretty steady with about 500. Um, and we are seeing more admissions over the last couple of years because we're doing a little bit more with some of our um, keel burns when it comes to uh, laser and uh, some of their scar management, which for a few, a handful of them would cause um, them to be admitted. So just so you know who, who this team is that makes all this happen, Dr. Bird will actually come and he'll talk to you later today. Uh, Randy, he doesn't. <laughs> Honestly, this is one of the better pictures I could find of him. <laughs> uh, Randy's a great guy. Um, he and I have worked together for the last 14 years uh, managing the trauma program. Um, and so much of what we do is um, because he is just so incredibly supportive. And he's very nurse friendly. He is married to a nurse and she has taught him well. Um, our attending surgeons, because sometimes you just don't get to see them very often. Uh, just want to point out a couple things. Like I said, Dr. Bird is up. We put him at the top because, you know, he is in charge. Um, however, the, the, the three at the bottom, Dr. Shep, Dr. Tejram, and Dr. Travis, these are hospital center burn surgeons. And our, the hospital center and children's, we signed an MOU about three years ago. And uh, hospital center surgeons now do take calls for at children's. You will see them rounding um, when they're on call on surgical care, the PICU, and we have burn patients. They only take care of burn patients. They are not taking care of our trauma patients versus the rest of uh, the guys and ladies that are up here. Um, our surgery fellows, they are really blurry. Sorry, especially Mark. Um, Adil Shah is our senior general surgery sir, uh, fellow. Mark Kogler is our junior uh, fellow. The other two fellows up there, those are colorectal fellows, but they will take uh, general surgery calls, so they will, you will see them with trauma patients. And then, of course, we have our nurse practitioners who you guys have seen out and about and really are um, part of the heart of the program. And then there's Cindy and I. Um, and unfortunately, Liz Weibel is also not pictured here. Cindy's our Outreach Education Injury Prevention Coordinator, hence the reason she's in the back running the show. Um, she does all of the wonderful stuff with social media. Um, she created, if you've seen the Easy TVSA app, um, that's all Cindy's doing. Uh, Liz Weibel is our PA coordinator, and I was trying to find a non, um, this sounds awful, I was trying to find a non-pretty picture of Liz, and I reached out to her husband the other day, and I'm like, I need a fun picture of your wife, and you can't tell her. He let me down. He did not send me a picture. So Liz Weibel is our PA coordinator. She was also a nurse practitioner with the nurse practitioner group. She'll still pick up some uh, MP shifts. But for the most part, Liz is really working very hard on looking at our quality program and doing patient case reviews, doing drill downs, and looking at how we continually make improvements. And then, of course, part of our team is all of you guys that are taking care of our patients um, because nothing could happen if you guys weren't on the floor. And that's one of the reasons that we are we work really hard to not only give you the hours that you're mandated to have by the, uh, by NIMS and the American College of Surgeons, but we try to do them in ways that are fun, that are interesting, um, that keep you engaged and really meet the needs you have in order to be able to provide the care that we're asking you to get. So just so you know, these, these hours that are up here, if you work in any of these places, those are your mandated hours. Those are your mandated hours every year. Um, Cindy is like a bulldog with your educators making sure that those happen. And so that's why your educators are on you. Like I said, she does a lot of things to make it fun. If you haven't had a chance, um, she started creating kind of our own little podcast 
Um, we have nine burn ones so far because we started with burn, burn casts. And we just launched the third trauma cast a couple weeks ago. They're a half hour. You get a, a 0.5 CN, a CNEs. Um, I think they're kind of fun and interesting. You can listen to them in your car. So we're really trying to see what it is you need and how best to get it to you. We also do look at ways that we can provide you more um, structured education. Uh, pediatric character resuscitation, we've done in-person classes several times over the years. Uh, recently, through the pandemic, we've been able to fund nurses to take the online version of this. Um, we are look we've sent ER, ER nurses to TNCC. We are currently looking at bringing TNC internally, and so we could have uh, more offerings and we could do it within our own walls. So hopefully within the next year, you'll see that. And then uh, some of our burn nurses we have sent to ABLS. Uh, Liz is an ABLS instructor, and so she keeps us very current in those. And then the app I mentioned. I thought I had a slide. Uh, this app went live in April. It, you can get it. It's free through app, uh, the Apple App Store or Google Play. You will be asked when you download it, you'll have to register, and you won't have the information to you immediately. Um, there are a lot of internal phone numbers, like mine, um, that are on this app, and so I'm trying very hard to keep it internal. So once you register, I get an email, and I have to approve your registration. So if you could do it with your children's email, that would help me out a lot. If you do it with your Gmail, I have to like go to uh, Outlook and make sure you work here um, because I just don't want to publish all those phone numbers, you know, for everybody in the outside world. The beauty of this app, though, it is it has every single trauma guideline for care. Um, we tried to structure it for the code. You know, there's a folder for the code room. There's a burn folder. Um, there's instructional videos on how to do a GCS assessment. All For those of you especially who work uh, with our burn population, all of the after the burn uh, videos are on there uh, to help you uh, share those with your patients. Um, it has all of our contact information. Awesome. So they got that. So it has all of our contact information. So you're taking care of a trauma patient. And you're like, this did not go well. Who do I tell? Well, you can find my name, you can find Liz, you can find Cindy, you can find Dr. Bird, and it has all of our contacts on there. And then just a lot of just interesting resources. I have uh, one thing on that app, you can push a button and find every important phone number you would need in order to take care of a trauma and burn patient. So we're continually updating that. Um, and then, of course, uh, I talked already about our research and quality. And I kind of want to just sum up with a few of our other injury prevention partners, uh, DC Safe Kids. Um, for those of you who may not know, Safe Kids Worldwide was started here at Children's National by Dr. Eichelberger and um, has now grown to not only be all through the United States, but incredibly international. Um, there's a lot of programs through Safe Kids, Safe Kids Buckle Up, Project Get Alarmed, uh, Walk This Way, et cetera. Safe Kids is a great place if you want to put some injury prevention in your practice. And there's no reason everybody can't. Um, go to Safe Kids. Go to the Injury Prevention Coalition. Go to some of your national organizations. They all have color sheets. They all have fact sheets that you could start using um, to give your, give, give your patients something to do to keep them busy. So um, I always end with a plug of see what you can do to bring injury prevention to the bedside. Okay, we are going to totally shift gears. And questions on any of that stuff, being a trauma center, as I shift gears. Okay. Um, we're going to go from that to talking about blood. So massive blood transfusion protocol. Um, how many of you work in either the ER, one of the ICUs, the OR, or transport? Okay, so a good number of you are going to be exposed to massive blood transfusion. Um, for those of you who, who are not usually exposed to it, it's still pretty interesting, to be honest with you. I have gotten very involved with the blood bank and the work that the blood bank's done. First of all, if you guys don't know, we have an amazing blood bank. Um, 
they have really taken the ball and are trying to really take us, you know, uh, moving forward as a national leader with uh, pediatric blood transfusion. And so they're really a joy to work with. And I've gotten a lot of time with the blood banks through. You see this hand, Cindy? <laughs> oh, good. Oh, whoever it is. Thank you. Uh, yeah, do that again. It was fun. Um, and so anyway, it, it's been a real joy to be able to really expand our capabilities with massive blood transfusion. And just a little history, it all, a massive blood transfusion all started with the military. Um, you know, how do we, what they needed to do was the fact that when you bleed, you bleed whole blood, right? We don't bleed platelets by themselves. We don't bleed plasma alone, and we don't bleed just red cells alone. We bleed whole blood. And so what they found is if we're bleeding whole blood, we have to replace whole blood. And the way we have it in the hospitals right now for a lot of reasons is in component therapy. You know, if you have a patient whose fibrinogen level is low, you give them plasma. If their platelets are low, you give them platelets. If their hemoglobin is low, you give them red cells. And that all actually makes sense, and it allows that supply of blood to be utilized efficiently. But there are subsets of patients, OB patients, trauma patients, who are really just bleeding is their main problem, and we need to give them blood products in a way that we can put that whole blood back together. And so that's where massive blood injury or transfusion started. It's looking at just reconstituting all those component therapies um, and putting it all back as one. If all I'm doing is just giving red blood cells, which is kind of how I, early in my practice, if you needed, if you were bleeding, we gave you red stuff and we did, kind of ignored the yellow. If I just gave you all red, I dilute out all your clotting factors. I dilute out all of that fibrinogen, all that uh, body's ability to heal a wound on its own. And if I just give red cells and I'm diluting out all of the clotting factor, it's going to increase my hemorrhagic mortality significantly. If I just gave plasma, um, great, it's a, probably the best volume expander out there. It has some fibrinogen. It's going to help with your clotting, uh, your clotting time. But if all I gave was plasma, I'm going to dilute out all my, hemo, all my red cells. So I'm going to dilute out all my hemoglobin. Well, if I dilute out all my hemoglobin, what's the oxygen going to bind to? So now I'm going to have a patient that's hypoxic. So I like to look at massive blood transfusion like a hot dog. And if you get a hot dog and if you're a ketchup and a mustard person, you want a good ratio of ketchup and mustard. You want to be able to taste the ketchup. You want to be able to taste the mustard. The same thing's happening with massive blood transfusion. You want to give equal parts of red and yellow, equal parts of mustard and ketchup. So a traditional massive blood transfusion protocol is going to look at equal parts. For every unit of red cells you give, you're going to give a unit of plasma and a unit of platelets. And that's going to keep everything kind of equal um, and promote that equilibrium and give you a pretty good hot dog. Now, does this work? Well, there's military studies. This was a military study done, and it looked at one-to-one -one transfusion. For every unit of red cells, they gave a unit of plasma. And I think it's a pretty cool outcome. If you look at, for every one unit of FFP, they gave eight units of PAC cells. Overall mortality was 65%, and hemorrhage mortality was 92.5. When they altered it and gave one unit of FFP to two and a half units of PAC cells, it cut mortality by more than, or by about half. And it dropped our hemorrhagic mortality to 78%. Now look what it did when we got more to that one-to-one -one ratio. That's a pretty significant drop compared to what I did early in my practice where it was mostly red cells when we had to replace. And so this does work. This combination of red and yellow and putting it all back together is pretty impressive. Now, as far as defining massive transfusion protocols, there is no universal uh, definition. The definition we use here is clinical ma uh, massive hemorrhage that's in a hard to control area, uh, ongoing blood loss of more than 150 mils per minute, 
and loss of more than half of the estimated blood volume in two hours. So really, these are kids that are going to be massively bleeding. And it's, let's just say it's obvious that they're massively bleeding. When we launch massive blood transfusion protocol, it's not like we're like, hmm, well, they look like they're losing a little bit of blood. It's one of those obvious, oh, my God, we've got to get some volume in these kids. So my, my latest excitement um, was in August. I had been begging and begging and begging for a new way in order to deliver massive blood transfusion. Because how many of you have ever gotten a bag of blood and you put it under your armpit to warm it up? Come on, some of it, somebody's done that before. Okay, somebody's done that before because it's really cold, right? And you really don't want to give really cold stuff in a lot of volume to a patient. What's going to happen if I give you two units of plasma and two units of red cells and it's just out of the refrigerator? What's happening to your patient? Yeah, they're going to get really cold. And guess what? When you are cold, you can't clot and you become very acidotic. And so we needed a way in order to rapidly give blood, warm blood, um, to our patients. And we have the level one transfuser. Anybody ever use the level one? A couple of you. Any of you so thankful you never had to because it looked like an absolute, no problem, it looked like an absolute nightmare? It was an absolute nightmare. Every time we used that old level one, we had user error, we had equipment error, and it, it, was, it was just bad, bad, bad. So in August, we were able to purchase the, uh, the Belmont. Um, the ER rolled the Belmont out about oh, three weeks ago. The ICU, uh, the PICU rolled it out last Friday um, and used it on a patient. CICU will be rolling theirs out November 1st. And the OR is waiting for stock. Uh, the stock just be figured out, and they should be rolling theirs out probably any day. Um, it's a much easier machine to use. It's very user-friendly. It allows us to give um, the max. If you have a big enough line, you can run fluid at 750 milliliters per minute, not per hour, but per minute. Um, and it, it does so well. Um, so if you haven't seen it, it's a pretty new, exciting piece of equipment that we have around. Um, you can run red cells through it, plasma, and normal saline. No platelets, no cryo. It'll break them up. So massive blood transfusion usage is not just for trauma. Uh, CICU is using it a lot. We've seen them um, uh, launch massive blood transfusion as they are getting ready to put kids on ECMO and just some of the other problems they see with those open heart babies. Um, the OR has been using it for unplanned bleeding. We've seen it used in cath lab um, a few times. Uh, the NICU has launched it a handful of times. The PICU is using it not just on our trauma patients, but on hemog patients, GI bleeds, anybody that has a bleeding issue. Um, it's a wonderful piece of tool, uh, thing. But remember, that volume goes in fast, so it's not for patients that you need to run blood over four hours. It is the patient you need to run blood in over two minutes. To activate massive blood transfusion here at Children's, uh, we have a hotline number, and it's uh, 5656. You don't have to do the 602. It's just 5656, and that gets you um, their emergency number, their red phone number. Um, when you call 5656, you basically say, hi, this is Jen. I need to activate massive blood transfusion. Let them know where you are. If it's an ECMO prime, you would want to tell them it's an ECMO prime. If it's not, you just give them the patient's name. And if you have the MRN weight, age, and gender, you can give them that. For those of you in the emergency department, it's just like, hey, this is Jen. We need to launch massive blood transfusion. Um, they tell me he's six years old. He's not here yet, but I need to get this going now and they'll, they'll kind of get you to that. They also would like a physician contact number um, in case there's any questions they have. Uh, we have massive blood transfusion packets that will help you um, because we don't do it often. There's a lot to remember and we don't think it's fair to ask you to remember. So there is a packet. In that packet, it will give you a list of labs with the appropriate tube, color tube, and tell you when you need to send them. And the biggest thing for massive blood transfusion is as soon as we possibly can, we need to get them a type and cross. And we actually need to repeat that type and cross a little bit later. Um, and you can do it like five minutes apart. And it's, it's, um, 
it's a way for the blood bank to um, double check and just make sure that we're, we're getting the right thing to the right patient. Um, and the reason we need to do that type and cross is when you're doing massive blood transfusion, you're using O negative red cells. And the universal donor for plasma is AB. And so if, if you get two different types, it's actually okay. But O negative and AB plasma are not um, very popular blood types, and so we only have a limited supply. So the faster we can type and cross our patients, the better it is for our patients and the better it is for our blood supply. Um, a couple of administration reminders when you are giving blood products, especially when you're giving it rapidly, every all your blood products still have to be filtered. If you use the Belmont, the Belmont tubing has a filter on there and will filter your red cells and your plasma. But don't forget, if you need to get platelets, you would still need to get a uh, filter out and filter those before you push those in. Um, when we do M uh, MBTP, we have done it enough over the years now that we have realized that there needs to be a leader that's kind of running the show. Usually that ends up being a nurse who is just keeping track of what have we given, what do we need to give next? Are we running out? Do we need to call the blood bank back? It's that one person who can be a point of contact with the blood bank so you don't have five or six people calling them all at the same time. Because if four of us are calling the blood bank, it's really getting in their way to being able to get us the blood product. Uh, that leader kind of, you know, is in charge of getting transport to and from there to pick up your blood. And they also should be the one to call blood bank and let them know that we're done with massive blood transfusion. That's probably the one thing that we are the worst at is we're really good at telling them we need to get it started because we need their stuff. But they keep going. They keep making blood packs until we call them back and say we're done. And there's a lot of times we forget to call them and they eventually call us and say, so where are we at with this whole thing? So keep that in mind. And then there's the paperwork because no good deed goes unpunished. And of course you have paperwork every time you're going to do massive blood transfusion. If you're doing it on the inpatient side with type cross blood, you can do it through bridge and it's not nearly as labor intensive. If you're doing this with O negative cells, especially if you're pulling them out of the refrigerator, there is a ton of paperwork. Um, each bag has two different forms that need to be filled out and both require a, a physician signature and it cannot be an NP or a PA. It has to be a physician. Um, and then of course, uh, when we are sending people to pick up blood coolers, there's a, a blood pickup request form that has to go with that. Um, as far as how we disseminate blood for a massive blood transfusion, here at Children we have three packs. You have a pack A, pack B, and pack C. Pack A is all red blood cells. It's kind of to get you started. Um, in the, the CICU and the ED both have blood refrigerators that have uh, red cells, and the ED now has plasma in theirs. Um, but those red cells get you started with pack A. Um, you can just do that if it's just emergency, you just need a little bit of blood, you don't have to call the massive blood transfusion, you can do emergency release. But pack A, what's in those refrigerators or what you would get in your first cooler if you don't have a refrigerator, is just red cells and it, it kind of gets you started. Um, pack B is going to be red cells, equal amount red cells, plasma, and platelets. And so we're going to really start giving that yellow product here. And then PAC C is equal amount of red cells, uh, plasma, and cryo. Blood Bank is going to continue to pull the next pack. So if you go pick up PAC B, they are already working on PAC C. When you pick up PAC C, you do not go back to PAC A. You just keep rotating PAC B and PAC C after you do the one time PAC A. So you've given all pack B, pack C, or A, B, and C. Again, like I said, you repeat back B, pack B and C until you decide the event is over because of one reason or another. Now labs, I already talked about type and cross and a repeat type and cross that we need to send, but it will be important to send as early as possible a CBC, clotting factors, um, a BMP, and a blood gas. The BMP is really to monitor that potassium and calcium level that's going to change because of all the blood transfusion. Now, will the physicians ever deviate from pack A, pack B, pack C and decide to do a la carte? Absolutely, and I have no way around that. Um, it is gonna happen. There is a lab called a TAG that can be done that can help guide those decisions and move you from the packs into a guided 
uh, massive transfusion protocol. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of times where just based on labs we've seen, based on the pathophysiology of the patient, based on the, the scenario at the moment, they may go off script and that's okay. Um, just remember bleeding, when the bleeding stops, again, we call blood bank to stop it. If we transfer a patient from one unit to another during massive blood transfusion, we can bring those coolers with us. So if I have a patient in the code room in the emergency department, we're going to the operating room. I'm going to bring whatever coolers I have so the operating room can keep going with massive blood transfusion. I will also call the blood bank. After I drop that patient and the coolers off, I will call the blood bank and say, hey, we've moved this patient. Please continue massive blood transfusion. But all, uh, all product now is going to be in the operating room. If the operating room is doing massive blood transfusion and they decide to transfer to the PICU, I don't know why they would do that if they were doing MBTP, but let's put it there. They would also be able to transfer that, uh, the coolers and the resuscitation to you. As far as you guys at the bedside, during massive blood transfusion, obviously access is going to be key. The bigger the access, the better. We can run the Belmont. We can run massive blood transfusion through an IO if you have to. Uh, central lines are great, but remember your, your double lumens and your central lumens. Sometimes as those get, as the lumens are going down, they get pretty small. And so um, there have been times that even with central lines, we've put in a large bore IV catheter in order to be able to get volume to patients quickly. Um, we need to look at that packet and make sure we're sending the appropriate labs. Um, I will tell you, we ran massive blood transfusion twice yesterday in the emergency department. And both of those kids, we were having a heck of a time getting labs. And so we finally, I, one of the ED docs did an art stick, so we were able to send those things. So be thinking creatively about how can I get these labs because the, that is just as important to monitor where we're at as it is to get that volume in for a variety of reasons. One of them could be that it's very easy to over-infuse so, or over-transfuse. So as we're giving blood, you know, we start giving it because they're bleeding, they're hypotensive, um, they start... Their tachycardia starts to resolve, their blood pressure starts to come up, but now we're kind of just in rhythm. And if we're not watching that H and H, we can kind of drive that up a little too high. Um, we're going to document the blood we give, and we don't want to just document I gave two units of red cells. It really is important to document the volume that we've given so we can look at that volume exchange with that patient. Um, that will help with some care decisions later on. And if you're using Bridge, you do not have to retain used bags. If you're not using Bridge, um, check with blood bank on if you need to send used bags back. Um, when you document, we need a start time of massive blood transfusion and the amount of volume given each hour. Uh, we're going to subdivide that by product, and then we want a stop time. So it really is important to know what we've given and when we've given it. Um, Coming soon to a hospital near you, um, we are going to be, hopefully, we are going to be part of a whole blood study. Um, we have not gotten confirmation that we are part of that study, but we have been working really hard. The blood bank is leading this initiative, and it is going to be a multi-center pediatric study looking at the use of whole blood in pediatrics. Um, there are some hospitals that are using whole blood right now, pediatric hospitals, very successfully. Um, and so I think it, it's really the wave of the future, and it will make all of our lives easier if we don't have to worry about red or yellow. We can just get a bag of whole blood. Um, and it sounds like it should be simple. Um, whole blood is much harder to store. Um, there's issues with the platelet component, mainly because platelets only live about five days. Um, there's some issues with potassium levels and watching patient potassium levels and some typing. And so there's a lot that goes into it. And so where I give the blood bank kudos at the beginning, I will even uh, up my kudos to the blood bank because bringing this in is going to be, um, be a feat, but it's going to make a difference um, at the bedside. So, ah, lots going on with blood. Questions? All right, Cindy, that's all I got.